We're especially glad to welcome today's speaker, Andrea Graham from Princeton. I've wanted to get her here since we started our program, ever since she came to the University of Michigan for a talk that I couldn't go to because I was in the clinic that day. Uh, but we had a conversation that morning, the next morning, that just made me realize that there was a whole way of doing immunology that was based on deep evolutionary thinking that could be enormously helpful for medicine. And I consider Andrea Graham a real leader of that whole area. Um, she did her bachelor's degree at Mount Holyoke with a double major in art and in biology, doing a wonderful field study that she can tell you more about if she wants to. Um, she then worked as a high school teacher for a couple of years uh, before moving on to take her PhD. Um, since I'm slightly discombobulated here, I'm going to <laughs> remind myself of it. You I haven't think had she, your sandwich yet. Right, and my sandwich <laughs> as well. Um, she took her PhD at Cornell, um, and after that went on to do postdoc work in Edinburgh. Um, and for the last many years, she's been at Princeton, where she now leads an, a network of researchers on evolutionary immunology with 70 people plus, which is turning out to be an extremely productive group. Um, she's an associate editor of Evolution Medicine and Public Health, and she has given talks all over the place. And we're very grateful to her for making the trip out west today and looking forward to her talk. Please welcome Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm absolutely delighted, and I certainly believe very much in uh, this movement that's growing here at ASU. And thank you very much also for the kind introduction. So this, this afternoon, I'm going to, especially now that I know you're all fortified with your sandwiches, I'm going to tell you about um, recent research that I've been leading on antibodies. I'm actually an evolutionary and ecological parasitologist by training. I came into immunology by way of field work, which is a strange way to come in, but I think it gives me a perspective on uh, host-parasite interactions that has proven valuable uh, for, for my understanding of immunology. I initially thought I was mostly interested in cytokines, so signaling molecules of the immune system, uh, but increasingly antibodies are becoming my favorite immunological molecule to think about, and I'm going to talk you through um, uh, some, of, some of that thinking now. Uh, before I launch in in earnest, I want to acknowledge that I'm representing a whole lot of people, mostly because the two studies I'm going to tell you about, one a wild animal study and one a human uh, study, a clinical study, um, both of them are extremely longitudinal studies. So um, they are representing 30 years and 26 years respectively of longitudinal study. And I, I can tell you I am not the main person to thank for any of that work having been done. The particular people I want to thank are um, some Edinburgh colleagues, especially Adam, Catherine, and Dan. Folks in my lab at Princeton, the one whose work is most relevant to what I'll describe today is Tina. Um, but also Noreen Goldman as a collaborator on the human clinical study. Uh, I also have important colleagues at Georgetown who do human demography and at Morden Research Institute in Scotland for sheep immunology. So there are some diverse themes coming through here. We very much need this interdisciplinary team to get the work done. Also a whole bunch of people at the Taiwan Department of Health and Bureau of Health Promotion because the human study has been based in Thailand for these 26 years. And then more generally, all the people who have the vision and, and just the wherewithal to pursue longitudinal studies. They're, they've been immensely valuable and certainly for uh, the kind of inferences I like to try to make. So to give you a sense of the rough structure of my talk, I want to begin by uh, introducing what I consider evolutionary explanations for immunological heterogeneity in susceptibility to infectious diseases on the one hand and autoimmune diseases on the other. Then I'll launch into the uh, system one, and this will be the mo most detailed um, system because I've been working on it longer. It's a wild sheep model system. I put that in quotation marks because in a sense I am proposing this as a model for thinking about immune function in the context of, of a uh, natural environment. Um, and then finally, I will come back to the human example, the motivation to consider sheep as a wild system that might test hypotheses for how antibodies function in humans as well. So one of the things that really struck me about antibodies that really won me over to the, how amazing they really are is that 
Um, they can provide incredible defense against all sorts of infectious diseases. This is a Portuguese immunologist who, who draw, always is drawing immunological uh, cells and molecules uh, in, a, in a charming way. The, I don't know if you can actually see, though, very well. Each antibody is depicted as kind of an alligator biting onto, um, capable of biting onto various uh, infectious agents. And what I think is so incredible about antibodies as an effector mechanism, as a parasite killing mechanism of, um, of vertebrate defense, is sometimes they're so good, so abundant or in the right place at the right time, that uh, you don't even know you've been exposed um, to uh, an infection. They're that good at, especially if you had an infection before, the secondary exposure leads to nothing from the parasite or pathogen point of view. And it is a really a powerful tool in public health, a vaccinologist dream. And they really are important for defense against all kinds of infectious agents. I think we think more about bacteria and viruses as being prime targets of antibody-mediated immunity. But as this um, textbook diagram illustrates, Antibodies of different varieties, different flavors of antibodies, actually uh, interact with other, um, with various cells of the immune system to kill a wide array of parasites and pathogens. And they even can participate in defense against worms. For a long time, nobody believed that. But recently, it's been demonstrated that antibodies in collaboration with things like mast cells are incredibly powerful tools in fighting off even intestinal worm infections. So for an evolutionary biologist thinking about antibodies, I'm you know, wowed by their public health importance and the array of parasites and pathogens they might combat. Uh, but I also was looking at a series of monographs um, published by Biozzi and colleagues showing um, the br very broad benefits of antibodies. What they did is they bred lines of laboratory mice to be high responders versus low responders. So they had high selection lines and long selection lines. Um, and they found that uh, no matter what antigens were used to generate the high responder versus low responder mouse lines, the high responder mice made strong antibody responses against all kinds of uh, anti antigens, including infection, various infections, as well as tumors. And they found that these high responder mice that were able to combat infectious diseases like nobody's business uh, wound up living a whole lot longer than the low responder. Uh, mice did. And they were interested in the genetics of this, and this was kind of old school genetics at the time, and uh, it hasn't been followed up on very, in very much detail yet, but they found that uh, antibody, general antibody responsiveness, so the ability to, uh, to bind all kinds of different um, uh, parasites, pathogens, and tumors, um, was associated with lifespan and that they were very closely genetically linked. They didn't demonstrate that antibody was the cause of lifespan lengthening in these mice, but they found that they were very closely linked. And the lifespan difference between low and high responder mice was something like 30%, 30% increase in, in lifespan. Uh, a, a lot, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, so uh, evolutionary biologists often think about the benefits across the lifespan of an immune defense, but of course always then is asking, what might be the cost? Because a whole lot of evolutionary analysis is sort of a cost-benefit analysis. Particularly, uh, this is important in explaining the maintenance of heterogeneity in traits. And so I also like to think about what the costs of antibody as a defense mechanism might be. And one of my favorite examples, I'm returning to this um, micrograph that was on my opening slide because I love it. This is a plasma cell and its endoplasmic reticulum is just absolutely jammed with proteins. It's about to secrete all of these antibodies. It's the antibody secreting uh, specialist cell of the immune system. And people have actually clocked the rate at which these, these antibodies are secreted. And an individual cell can secrete thousands of antibodies per second, which just blows the mind, and sustain that for weeks, right? So several weeks of thousands of antibodies per second. And what that brings to mind for someone with my background in ecology and evolutionary biology background is every amino acid invested in that protein secretion, that antibody secretion, is an amino acid that the host can't spend on other stuff the host needs to do evolutionarily, right? So that means growth if it's a young organism or reproduction if it's an adult organism. So antibodies we think ha might have resource costs that pose interesting trade-offs for uh, evolution to solve, natural selection to solve. 
They also can cause disease, so they can lead to immunopathology. This is another way of thinking about a cost of defense. Not only must the host invest amino acids in antibodies, but if they uh, have a specificity that directly attacks the host's own organs, this could be a cost of a strong antibody response. And then there's also um, when they're just at very high titers or um, uh, have, a, have very general reactivity, um, they can actually end up in depth depositing immune complexes, basically big clumps of antibodies um, that can really damage organs of filtration. So an example there uh, would be the kidneys. Kidneys can very uh, readily be damaged by immune complex deposition. And this is the example I really want to think about with you for the rest of the talk. This is um, along the lines of systemic lupus erythematosus. This is one of the big pathology generating mechanisms of lupus. Um, and I think that the two example systems I'm going to talk you through have the most potential to inform how we might think about lupus as an autoimmune disease. So for me, an influential paper on this is quite um, over 10 years ago now, Arbuckle and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine were puzzling through what the causes of lupus might be. And um, it seems to uh, be, have both genetic as well as environmental influences. And what the thing I thought was really useful about this was they were pointing out that there's this whole spectrum of immune responsiveness where we have what, what they called normal immunity, antibodies functioning as we intuitively think they ought, fight off parasites, don't attack self, or something like that. But then there's also this category um, that they call benign autoimmunity, where having antibodies that are specific to one's own tissues, although it's sort of counterintuitive, that doesn't necessarily necessarily lead uh, anywhere bad for the host, and I think that will become clearer as I talk you through my examples. Then you start moving towards where they actually are doing damage, and then finally the, the, the person with lupus might become ill. And so I, I, was, I liked this simple way of cartooning that there are both genetic and environmental factors influencing, and that's like candy to an evolutionary biologist, um, but also this spectrum of um, of outcomes. And what I thought when I looked at this is that at this end of the spectrum, strong antibody responses are probably all good, right? All to the good. And it's only at this end where the costs might begin to accrue. Others have even uh, gone so far as to say that the magnitude of the antibody response um, might actually be under control of just this suite of, of FC receptors, basically, that bind the conserved regions of the antibody molecule. And they've done wonderful work suggesting that selection due to things like malaria parasites may actually maintain susceptibility to uh, lupus. And really, the, the, the main thing here is that um, this is a little bit of a lever controlling the overall magnitude of immune responses. And this is the kind of evidence that led me to suspect that there could be a trade-off, right? That the individuals who are especially prone to lupus will be especially resistant against parasites. And it inspired some of the work that I'm about to describe to you, but you'll see we didn't really find that. Okay, so for an evolutionary biologist, the main thing I want to understand are the causes of heterogeneity. So ultimately, for me, the puzzle is no two are alike, even though these look um, remarkably similar one to the next immunologically. And the, the question is why and how much can we understand about the maintenance of that diversity by understanding both the costs and the benefits of antibody responsiveness. And this study, um, this photograph is not random, randomly chosen. I pick sheep because sheep really are the um, a main focus of my research in recent years. Though it's not domestic sheep, it's wild sheep that live in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. So this is um, one of the Soe sheep lambs that lives on the island of Herta in the St. Kilda Archipelago. So this is England and Scotland. Um, and it is 60 kilometers out into the Atlantic beyond the otherwise outermost Hebrides islands. And uh, I do think um, in addition to, to being a very exotic, although rainy, place to visit, um, it also has the potential to be a model system for evolutionary medicine, and I'll explain why. So this is a, the sheep uh, species that, it's the same species as domesticated sheep, it's just a breed that has inhabited the St. Kilda Archipelago since Neolithic times. So about 4,000 years ago, some enterprising people brought sheep from Central Europe to these islands. And they kept them there as a backup food source for when the gannets failed. They mostly subsisted on seabird eggs, and they would hunt sheep when the seabird eggs were um, insufficient. 
Um, they've been unmanaged, so they've basically never been domesticated. We certainly can't find evidence of any domestication in the history of this, this breed, except that they were willing to get on a boat with some people. Um, they've been unmanaged since 1930, when the human occupants were evacuated from the island. And then they've been thoroughly studied since 1985, and I'll come back in a minute to what I mean by thoroughly studied. But the key thing here is that they're experiencing natural mortality but no predators. And predators are, of course, part of natural regulation of herbivore communities. Uh, but when you're a parasitologist or you want to study host-parasite interactions, you're slightly relieved when there are no wolves out there um, picking off the, the sickest, for example. So this natural mortality um, can be quite substantial. And we really do think that parasites have a very important role, a lethal synergy between malnutrition and parasite burden, especially gut worms. This is just a time series over most of the period of this, this, this study. Um, we study the village bay population of sheep, which repeatedly is about a third of the whole island's population. And what you can see is that there are these boom-bust dynamics. Some years there's a very low or relatively low sheep um, density on the island, and then that population rises, and then there are these periodic overwinter crashes where up to 60% of the sheep die. And gross pathological evidence suggests it's malnutrition and parasites causing the death. So no predators and a strong role for uh, immune defense potentially in promoting survival. Why is your population growing? Yes. So there is a significant secular trend for increased carrying capacity on the island. And this is the killer question um, of uh, that there's a focus of a lot of people's work in the collaboration. The idea is that um, the sheep are getting smaller. They are getting significantly smaller. And what we need to do is the biomass calculations and ask whether this is a constant sheep biomass. And it just translates to more sheep individuals because they're so much smaller now. <coughs> Okay, so when I say thoroughly studied, what I mean is this, that um, individuals get earrings, ear tags, within uh, 24 hours of birth, and then they are monitored throughout their lives. So we know the birthday and death day of every sheep on the island. We know who had which babies when. We know, really know the, know the whole uh, detailed demography for uh, almost 8,000 sheep in these 30 years. And um, we have a pedigree as well. I guess that makes sense since we know who gave birth to whom. We certainly know the mothers, and, but with modern molecular tools, we also can pinpoint who the fathers were. So we have an over nine generation deep pedigree as well. So this is powerful because we can study the heritability of traits. So every August, um, a bunch of, because these animals were never domesticated, you can't herd them the same way you might think we ought to be able to. Certainly sheep dogs would think there was something wrong with these sheep because when you run at them, they run apart. They don't, they don't flock, basically. So a bunch of scientists try to catch them every August, which is kind of like a slapstick comedy hour. Um, and we herd them into traps. And we catch 50 to 60% of them each summer, each August. And we make lots of measurements, including body size, body condition, and various estimates of parasite count, and also take blood plasma samples. And where I came in was really um, diving back into the freezer. I think of this sort of a biobank, a plasma bank, that allows me to ask across that time series of host boom bust dynamics um, what what were their immune systems doing? So then I just take um, those samples and run fairly standard immunological assays on them, often adopted from either clinical or veterinary medicine. And I wanted to give you a sense of the, the working conditions. This is the building where we do a lot of our immunology work. Um, it used to be the feather store where the islanders kept the gannet feathers with which they paid their taxes to the Lord of the Isles. So it used to be the feather store and the tax collector would come empty, empty it every so often. But now it has the world's cutest minus 80 freezer and all sorts of things. <laughs> and one of our study subjects grazing just outside. Okay, so um, I began by um, wanting to assess whether these sheep were prone to autoimmunity. Because actually the hygiene hypothesis, for those of you who are familiar with that, suggests that animals who are absolutely full of parasites and also malnourished half the time shouldn't be very prone to autoimmunity to begin with. So I felt like my first test was to deploy a very general um, plasma or serological test for autoimmunity. And the one I chose was anti-nuclear antibodies, or ANA. So all you have to remember, that that's I think the main acronym I'm gonna ask you to remember throughout this lecture. Um, it is basically uh, 
an index of the concentration of antibodies that bind antigens of mammalian intracellular constituents. So things like histones and centromeres. Um, we had to adapt it. It was a clinical kit meant for use in humans. We adapted it for use in sheep um, with appropriate positive and negative controls. Um, and this is where we really began our studies of the immune phenotype in the sheep population. Now we know that a positive test for ANA, like if any of us went to the hospital and came back, oh, you're ANA positive. It, this is part of the benign autoimmunity spectrum. And um, they, the doctor would have to do a whole bunch of follow-up tests to ask whether you're actually going to be experiencing an autoimmune disease. Um, right. So when we rolled this test out to um, sheep sampled during 11 years of that time series, here's what we found. The first thing we found is that if we account appropriately for um, or for background and also do a dilution series as would be done in a hospital to ask um, exactly how believable these high titers were. We found that 28% of the adult female sheep shown here and 15% of the males here um, were what would be considered ANA positive if they'd gone to their doctor. Um, and we also see, I think even more striking, is that there's huge heterogeneity in the concentration of these antibodies in the blood of these sheep. And individuals are captured and sampled multiple times, so we were able to ask, how repeatable is it, right? If you get an individual's ANA titer in one year, how likely is the titer in the following year to be of a comparable magnitude? And it was hugely repeatable. I'll come back to that um, in, in a few moments, but it's, it's consistent. Individuals are consistent in the ANA titers they express, and it runs in families. There is a significant signature uh, of the pedigree mattering for the ANA concentration. Yes? Do you have similar polymorphism They have been described, though not in great detail, in domesticated sheep, yes. Um, but in this population, we don't yet know, but we have the potential to know soon because Josephine Pemberton, who's really the head honcho on the team now, she's recently snip chipped all 7,000, 8,000 sheep. And so pretty soon we'll be able to ma map candidate gene polymorphisms onto the immune phenotype data. Okay, so finding one was simply that they, despite being hungry and absolutely chock full of parasites, the prevalence and intensity, especially of worm infections in these sheep are quite um, uh, mind boggling. They're autoimmunity prone or, or they have, um, they meet clinical criteria for having autoimmunity. So again, as an evolutionary biologist, I wanted to know um, how that might map onto benefits and costs um, associated with survival and fecundity. And of course, these are associations because this is not an experimental study, but I wanted to know whether ANA were associated in any way with survival and fecundity. And the first thing that we found was um, a positive association between overwinter survival and these ANA. So this is the this axis represents odds of surviving one of those overwinter crashes against the mean centered index of the anti-nuclear antibody concentration. And we saw across the range of variation, this is just for a subset of the years depicted here, um, there was a 16% increase in survival probability across the range of variation that we observed. And we were controlling for all the other things that affect survival probability, like the age of the sheep, its sex, its weight. And compellingly, um, I thought that what, what was really amazing was that these ANA titers, we began to be able to also measure parasite-specific antibodies, though those reagents took longer to come online, and also total immunoglobulins in the samples, uh, in these plasma samples, and the ANA were positively correlated with that. It sort of uh, started painting a picture that autoimmunity might be a collateral of being good at fighting the infectious diseases that we know to be so important. I'll come back to that in a moment. It seems like there's a, a related um, compounder, which is not just weight, but sort of the amount of adipose tissue or extra resources mm -hmm. the individual has. You imagine a large, lean animal versus a short, small, fat animal with different survival. Right. So until recently, we are doing the sheep equivalent of body mass index, which is sort of correcting body weight for uh, hind limb length. 
um, and that didn't change any of this. Um, what we've done more recently is start using the plasma to look for what nutritional plane they're on, so measuring albumin and uh, leptin we're hoping to do as an index of how uh, much adipose tissue they have. We, we're not quite there yet. But what's amazing is that those really matter, unlike the body mass index. Those tell us something new, but they don't knock antibodies out. Okay, so these are the, the first findings and see there might be some survival benefit to strong antibody responses. And at the time I thought, oh, this autoimmunity we're measuring is just telling us about who's actually good at fighting infection. Um, but the first thing we did before pursuing the infection specific response further was to say, why have 4,000 years, if, if the time period we've observed is anything like the last, the preceding thousands of years, why have thousands of years of that kind of selection not eliminated weak responders. If there's even a 16% survival advantage you would expect would accrue to wipe out low ANA, uh, low antibody responders. Why aren't all sheep lupus prone, in, in other words? And we found that there were negative associations between annual breeding and those same titers of antibodies. So that's depicted here. Um, annual probability of breeding success for rams on the left and ewes on the right, and there was a consistent pattern in both, although the range of variation on the y-axis is very different, partly because of the, the mating system of the sheep. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that later. But the key thing is that as um, individuals went up in the ANA um, concentration axis, their odds of an, uh, breeding success in any given year decline. Um, we also saw, just to add another layer of complexity, that those females who did breed seemed to con um, pass along the survival advantage to their offspring. This is like the next generation getting whatever the survival advantage was of the strong antibody response. But um, in a given year, um, the odds of a mum with high ANA breeding were, were relatively low. Now, we don't know the mechanistic cause of this. It may be down to those amino acids I was talking about. Uh, every additional amino acid spent budding heads, if you're a ram, or growing um, a fetus, if you're a ewe, is an amino acid you can't spend on an antibody response. It may very well be that that's uh, what's, what might force this trade-off. But there are other possibilities, especially in ewes, because pregnancy is actually an immunological phenomenon, and immunosuppression is required for um, uh, successful delivery. But long story short, what we found, we were able to actually study lifetime reproductive success, so both survival and fecundity of these sheep. Um, no matter the strength of their antibody responses, they all left um, in the case of the ewes, this is, these are the data, in the case of the ewes, about six descendants. Some of the ewes live 12 or 15 years and breed sort of every couple years, have a, have a lamb every couple years. Some only live about five years but have twins every year for a few years. Um, and so that's why I sort of have this live fast, die young versus live long and skip breeding events contrast. Yeah. Um, but it is if you if you bring environment in we've corrected it by bringing environment in because under some environmental conditions so at times when there are a lot of sheep around there's very little food right at times of high density they're more food limited there are more parasites around because I haven't said this but these are fecal oral transmitted parasites and so we expect those crashes to disproportionately kill the 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 high breeder phenotypes. And then in between time, we expect the breeders to outpace, um, uh, outpace the others. And so if we bring in that environmental heterogeneity, it does translate to equivalent fitness. So newborn offspring all have about the same reproductive value despite their parents' DNA levels? Yes, because of the environmental variation. Yep. So such a trade-off is um, has the potential to maintain immunological heterogeneity. Basically, if, if investment in immune defense confers survival advantage but reproductive cost, this is a, in the context of environmental heterogeneity um, that affects the risk of exposure to parasites, this is a um, potential evolutionary mechanism by which autoimmune genes can be maintained in populations. Okay, but I, as I told you, I come from a background in parasite ecology, and so I wanted to close the loop and come back to um, 
how this relates to their ability to fend off parasites. So what I've done here, um, a number of sheep is projected over here onto this gray axis. This is the, these are the same data we were looking at before. But what I've added now are um, the average worm burden in lambs, sort of considering lambs as sentinels for the intensity of worm transmission in a given year. You can see that is highly heterogeneous and um, to a large extent tracks host density. And that makes sense, right, for this density dependent transmission of a fecal oral uh, transmitted pathogen. Okay, so what we did for the same period of study that in which we studied ANA, which is shaded in gray, we also measured uh, their antibodies against some of these nematodes, particularly one called Telodorsagia circumcincta, which is the most pathogenic of the nematodes that they get. Now, we know that um, the number of nematode larvae that a sheep eats per, per kilo of forage um, is high and variable across that period of time, but it's all high, 400 to 2400 nematode larvae per kilo of grass. It's quite a potent force of infection. Um, the worms come in, undergo, um, uh, first of all, they penetrate into a gland in the true stomach, and this is partly why they're most, they're very pathogenic. They're burrowing back and forth across the gut wall. They undergo some molts, they grow, and then eventually they emerge back onto the um, mucosal surface where they find mates and then uh, lay eggs and they go out the other end. Um, what veterinary immunologists have shown is that antibodies are super important at various stages here for the ability of the host to deal with these uh, parasites. They can kill the incoming larvae, they can arrest them, keep them from coming back out of the gut wall, and they can also stunt the adults. And so for all of these reasons, uh, especially if you're confined to plasma as a uh, way of studying immunology, it's a pretty, uh, antibodies are a pretty compelling way to study resistance against these nematodes. So we found, just as for the ANA, individuals were highly heterogeneous in their nematode-specific antibody titer, and repeatedly so. In fact, uh, for both of these um, antibody specificities, over 35% of the total variance in the titers was due to heterogeneity at the individual level. It's just um, a quantification of what everybody knows when they study a real population of animals and measure immune responses, the incredible heterogeneity. Um, this included uh, significant additive genetic effects. Okay, so then we returned to consider the survival result in particular. I, we also thought about reproduction, but I'm going to focus on survival for the, today. So when we ran very similar analyses to what I described for the autoantibody, um, but now for the nematode-specific antibody, we again found that overwinter survival increased with increasing antibody responsiveness. In fact, the effect size here is 26% increase in survival probability across the range of antibody responses. Um, and we saw that, as you might intuitively expect, the individuals with the highest nematode-specific antibody titers had the lowest burden of nematode eggs in their feces. So we think this all adds up to um, this antibody being a marker of their ability to clear these parasites and it's improving survival. The thing I thought though is that once we developed the ability to measure this, I thought statistically we would knock the, uh, the ANA out of the model. Basically I thought this was going to totally explain the survival advantage that we had described in the ANA positive sheep, but it didn't. This is completely independent of this. Again, controlling for age and weight and other, um, uh, other factors that we know predict overwinter survival. So this leaves us with um, a kind of interesting take home uh, message. Lupus prone sheep live longer and this is independent of their ability to uh, fight off one of the most important infections that we know they're exposed to. And so at this point, I did proper reading on what ANAs are really doing. First of all, ANAs are a pool, a heterogeneous pool of antibodies that include a bunch of different specificities that you can easily see would be to the advantage of a host independent of uh, infection-specific defense. So one of the roles of ANAs is by aiding more general organismal homeostasis. So for example, macrophages of the immune system are very important in cleaning up damaged tissue, necrotic or apoptotic cells. 
and they do so more efficiently when those, those items are opsonized. Just as macrophages are better at taking up pathogens when they've been tagged with antibody, the same may be true for the more general self-maintenance roles of macrophages. So we maybe are picking up upon those within the ANA pool. There may also be natural antibodies, which are non-specific antibodies sort of secreted by B1 cells for the immune aficionados in the audience. Um, uh, these are considered sort of the humoral innate immune defense. They are antibodies that can mop up a pathogen you've never seen before because they're very broadly um, reactive. So we're working on this now. We haven't really solved this yet, but so far we know that um, the ANA associations we've described are independent of any role for immunoglobulin M, which is one of the very um, cross-reactive um, antibodies in that pool, or cross-reactivity with other pathogens that we know the, the, the sheep have. But we're um, really interested in whether this autoimmunity lifespan connection might be explained in part by ANAs, some subsets of that population having very host protective roles. But another thing we want to know is whether the sheep who are ANA positive and maybe at the highest end of that spectrum, do they actually eventually have immune complex deposition or any of the other symptoms of lupus? We have not figured out how to get urine out of these sheep. They're not that cooperative. Um, but we do have, in, after a big population crash, we do a lot of necropsies. And so we have kidney samples that we are going to um, uh, analyze histopathologically for evidence of immune complex deposition. So even though we, we say that this autoimmunity is associated with longer life, survival of crashes and longer lifespan, perhaps lupus-like or autoimmune disease is part of what kills them in the end. The only thing we've managed to do on this front to, um, to ask whether the sheep might be having uh, some lupus-like progression is we looked at some of the subspecificities of the ANAs within the, the complex pool. Sorry, this is a complicated slide. This is, this is a longitudinal study of individuals who all eventually were diagnosed with lupus, and so this is their diagnosis point. But they were studied longitudinally to see what the uh, predictors were. ANA, ooh, it's hard to see the colors, isn't it? But the, I think that's ANA here. So ANA definitely is coming up. Um, in the lead up to diagnosis. What we decided to do is look at this one as well, that in humans at least, comes up right before diagnosis. It seems to be more immediately predictive of clinical signs. And we found that a few of the sheep were also positive for this. It was a smaller number, um, but it could be that, we, that the sheep really do represent a system in which lupus uh, is, is modeled. Okay, but I, before we wind down, I wanna bring this back to um, the evolutionary medicine question now. How generalizable is any of this? Because you may or may not care too much about uh, lupus in sheep, but we might like to understand it better in people. So to motivate this, I want to say that in the sheep, when we first looked at the data cross-sectionally, we saw that um, the ANA uh, concentration when we control for family and all sorts of the other things that um, uh, we knew were important in determining ANA concentration. Um, and we then looked at it with respect to age, we see a strong increase with age. And um, only when we looked at the data longitudinally were we able to say this isn't because within individuals, as they get older, there are more and more ANAs circulating. It's that these guys die young. So it's selective disappearance of these guys. Now, why am I telling you all of this? It's because this pattern has been observed in a whole bunch of other systems. This has uh, been observed in people in both um, Cameroon and Sweden. It's been observed in baboons, mice, chickens, pythons, crocodiles. You can't even believe the systems people are looking at ANA in. Um, so, and a lot of times people infer that this is a great marker of immunosenescence or age-related decline in immune function or something. But my question was, if we studied these other species longitudinally, would we find similarly that there's actually selective disappearance of those who are low on the ANA spectrum? Is that, are ANA similarly associated with long life in other species? So the, I wanted to show you some raw data. This is how these folks chose to show their baboon by, boom, by baboon autoantibody titers. Um, and they depicted it this way, but they also analyzed um, the data according to age, so it's a sort of a parallel of that cross-sectional analysis I just showed you. 
And after a very early burst of ANA activity and development, they saw that individuals that lived a long time, that lived to be in their 20s, um, seem to have higher ANA concentrations. But studies like this never, for some reason, never um, study ANA longitudinally, even though these were laboratory animals that in principle could have been studied longitudinally. So what I've discovered is actually people are um, more routinely studied longitudinally, and it's actually much more straightforward to convert the expected to convert the cross-sectional analysis into a longitudinal analysis, as I had in mind. And this is where I was very lucky to join another long-term collaboration. Um, this is Noreen and uh, Dana and Maxine and a lot of people in the Taiwan Department of Health. It is a long-term social and biological study of late-life health um, across Taiwan. They have a nationally representative sample. So the timeline of this study is that in 1989 they began, and the, this is where the Department of Public Health folks go every year and interview and examine all of these individuals. About 1,400 individuals born between 1892 and 1953. And there were in two rounds of biomarker collection um, in 2000 and in 2006 where blood and urine samples were taken. And then they update the mortality data every five years. So we're just due for another mortality update um, in, the early, in early 2016. Now, studying humans, late life human health, immunology, I find that herpes viruses are inescapable. You cannot study this sort of thing without taking into account the important role of herpes virus and the so-called immune risk profile in um, immunosenescence. And so the idea here is depicted in this cartoon where individuals who are um, seropositive for cytomegalovirus, which is an important herpes virus that in probably is the one that jams the memory banks most of elderly humans. Um, in individuals who are positive for that virus, the immune risk profile is sort of encapsulated here where inflammation really goes up um, their B cells and their uh, T helper cell counts really go down. It's sort of like a tipping of the balance away from adaptive immunity toward a very strong inflammatory um, environment. And this um, ticks mortality and various morbidities up quite severely. This has been especially described in Scandinavian uh, populations where immune risk profile is one of the best predictors of imminent mortality. Um, whereas in cytomegalovirus seronegative individuals, they, they end up with more functional T and B cell immunity. They don't tip the balance over into a lot of inflammation, and they do not um, die or suffer disease at the same rates, and they maintain quality of life as well. So we couldn't ignore all of this in studying late life human health. So what we're doing is basically bringing ANA measures into this broader study where they've already measured quite a few of the, uh, in their biomarker rounds, quite a few um, immune variables. In addition to ANA, I brought in an anti-inflammatory cytokine. I don't think we have time to really talk about it, but happy to discuss later. And then these um, herpes virus specific antibody titers that are supposed to be so important for immune risk profile development. So, of course, the first thing we did was ask, do we see cross-sectional increase in ANA concentration with age? So looking at the data much as everybody looked at the baboons and pythons and everything. And, we, and the answer is yes. At both the 2000 and 2006 biomarker time points, if we look at the concentration of uh, ANA um, against age, we see, and this is controlling for uh, sex and location of residence, we find um, an increase with age. So cross-sectionally, it looks just like every other um, study. We already know, because they've done these other rounds of biomarker measurement, that inflammation is a predictor of age-specific mortality in this population. And I apologize, this table is, um, they don't, for some reason, draw um, plots. They tend to have tables where they encapsulate this information. But what I wanted to point out, especially for a pro-inflammatory 
cytokine like interleukin-6, um, they find a significantly increased hazard of mortality between 2000 and 2011 in this population for individuals who have elevated IL-6. So basically what we're doing is bringing ANA into um, the context of these, these sorts of models. And the hypothesis is that ANA should, if it has the kind of role we think it does on the basis of the sheep, if the sheep hypothesis proves true, ANA should be associated with reduced risk of death even when competing with all these other um, immune predictors. And it's very early days in these analyses, um, but I will give you a tidbit to think about, which is that when we account for age-specific as well as sex-specific mortality, plus some of the pro and anti-inflammatory factors that have the expected associations, lots of inflammation, higher risk of death, lots of anti-inflammatory activity like IL-10, lower risk of death, it, it's all adding up to our expectation, we find that individuals with high ANA did indeed have lower 11-year mortality rates. So that's just depicted here, where ANA, this is just showing you the 2000 data, um, probability of death by 2011 in those with the lowest ANA titers was about one in five, and this declined across the range of ANA concentrations. So, so far, analyses suggest the people are indeed like the sheep. The herpes viruses are driving me crazy because they're interacting with ANA in pretty complex ways. Did someone start asking a question? Okay, I thought I heard something. Um, so we find that as the immune risk profile predicts, CMV is associated with increased mortality risk. We see no such signal for Epstein-Barr virus, but cytomegalovirus we do. And it seems that ANA is interacting with that such that um, individuals who are CMV positive and maybe even have a fairly high viral titer, if they also have ANA, they, their mortality risk is ameliorated. But it's, again, it's early days. We also are measuring titers of antibodies against pandemic influenzas to have a kind of a metric of how uh, immunocompetent they are, how well they're remembering these pandemic viruses that we know just about every one of them would have been exposed to. Okay, so to wrap up, um, I, I like to think, I, I definitely consider my work to fit under the evolutionary medicine umbrella, although I think almost exclusively about host parasite interactions. I like to think that cross-system similarities may be common, even though people at a medical school, when I give this kind of a talk, they're startled to be hearing about sheep often. Um, but I think um, it's possible that evolutionary causes of disease may have even more in common across systems than the proximate causes, the mechanistic causes. Um, I also think that at a minimum, wild animals suggest testable hypotheses because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question as to whether these humans in Taiwan will um, exhibit, other than the fact that they also live on an island, um, do they have other stuff in common with these sheep? Do they exhibit the same uh, potentially life prolonging effects of being prone to autoimmunity? And if so, we may have um, some evidence um, that would support uh, evolution as an important mechanism of maintaining autoimmune susceptibility in populations. And more generally, this is one of my favorite recent um, figures from a review article. Um, I think that this, the message of this is absolutely right, is that um, to understand immunology, we learn a lot at this end of the spectrum of wildness of, of systems one might focus on. So this is a clean mouse in a clean box uh, treated with antibiotics and controlled environment galore. But if we don't take advantage of all these points in the middle of the wildness spectrum, as well as things like the soe sheep who are over here somewhere, you can think of them as feral if you like, or wild, but they're certainly at this end of the spectrum, uncontrolled environment, etc. cetera. Um, I think we're really gonna miss out on a lot. We certainly will miss out on the evolutionary understanding of immunology, but I think even the environmental component, the contribution of environment to immune function will miss out on. Um, and they make the case that immune, or sorry, uh, human environments definitely fall somewhere in the middle of this spectrum. So we better not ignore, um, we better not keep all of our immunology studies over there at the left. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to further questions. I already have good ones.
Yeah. Can you pass the microphone around so that people can see it over? Hi. Uh, great. Exciting talk. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come back. I thought of it earlier in the talk and then with your ending talking across the spectrum of different kinds of life ways of different animals. One of the things that's really interesting about your system, of course, is the relaxation of predation. And so I'm curious to, to what your thoughts are in terms of is there some kind of uh, ESS between the fast livers, fast reproducers, and the long livers, slower reproducers that are emerging in the population dynamics as a function of the relaxation of predation? That is a great question, and I wish I, I had a better answer for you. I, I definitely expect were predators a major impact on this population, we, we would see completely different things. We might not be able to detect any of the associations, right? I mean, if it's true that predators will, will preferentially pick out the weak, right, the ones who are very sick, we would see um, potentially that our low responders would have that additional selection pressure to deal with, right, for example? Yeah, I, I, I guess I mean more, you'd expect that the animals that initiate reproduction at younger ages and have twins which seem to be the ones with lower... Okay, DNA, right, so you're they, saying independent they would of the host They'd be election. overrepresented in subsequent generations under predation, but as you say, it could be that there's you know, not random predation across the population. And so is there any evidence, when you go into like the historical records, that the proportion of these, these slower lifespan animals, slower reproduces, are increasing in the population? We do not have that evidence, no. Um, we could, in principle, go back and look um, and try to, I guess the problem is that we don't actually think this is dichotomous, right? I kind of presented as such for illustrative purposes, but we think it's a continuum. And so we would have to say, let's go back and measure their antibody responses and act like that's a continuum for their life history strategy. Um, and in that case, we should, we would expect to see that the mean antibody responsiveness should track those population boom-bust cycles quite closely. But analytically, that proves really hard. It's actually very hard to quantify that. Um, but in, intuition suggests absolutely that crashes should be major selective events that weed out low responders, and in between time should be the time when the, the, uh, the low immune responders will, will bloom again. Now, under climate change, people people reckon that the growing season for the greenery on the island is getting longer and longer. I don't know if you noticed that recent years in the population dynamic look a bit weird. They don't quite boom bust as much. Um, and we expect that might be really important for sh tipping the balance. Yeah. I just want to follow up on that really yeah. quick. Um, what year did you say humans stopped preying on these sheep? Because humans were the predators, right? Humans That's were the predators, yes, occasionally. A couple of sheep a year. And when did they stop 1930. Preying? So you're looking at a period of time that could represent really rapid selection to a new life history because the predators have only been removed for 70, 80 years, and you already described what might be really rapid evolution of insular dwarfism when I asked my question about population growth. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that there's there is maybe some really rapid evolution going on in your population while you're studying it. Does that uh, affect what you're thinking about the way the system, what you're seeing now versus what would be more true in a natural system? That had so predators? first of all, I'm um, just kind of following up on Kate. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, first of all, we know that at least the population dynamics of sheep on other islands, there are other islands in this archipelago where there are also soe sheep, and we know the boom-bust dynamics are actually shockingly synchronized, even though none of those were ever hunted. So we think at least in terms of host population dynamics, we're, um, we're not studying a weird island. Um, but you may be right that there were effects of the periodic human hunting on the gene pool of the sheep, and we're looking at something very downstream of that. Um, I think that's one of the, one of the breaks that we take for, for studying this system. I certainly am not bothered by the idea evolution is an action. I There's love that. There's nothing wrong with that. I just wonder if you have insights as to how you think that what you're seeing now, given that there may be really rapid 
selection taking place on the life history. Yeah, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm delighted that it's happening. I think it's, it's exciting because it means that environment, instead of environmental variation being of this form where it's slightly un, you know, chaotic dynamics, it actually, there's a, there's a trajectory to it and it gives us an opportunity to try to predict. And this is what I started saying at the end of my response to her question, which is that if it's true that the growing season is getting longer, the carrying capacity is going up, it's getting to be a nicer place to be a sheep, then we would expect the balance of um, high responders versus low responders, again, pretending it's dichotomous, but the balance to um, be shifted towards the low responders. It should favor high breeders now, right? And, and I love that, and we can predict that, and maybe we can even test it. We certainly are continuing to monitor the, the population, and on these time scales at which the, the body size is getting smaller and the carrying capacity is going up, um, if the immune phenotypes are also changing on those same time scales, we'll be able to observe them by 2020. So I think it's very exciting. Is there a way to say what kills them? Uh, yes, I mean, we can, uh, we have the gross pathological evidence, um, but we also have a bunch of vets now newly interested in this. Basically, since we started publishing the ho more of the host parasite interaction side of things, vets are getting excited. Exposure, starvation? Yeah, yeah, we, we're, be, we're working with vets to develop both plasma markers and then necropsy and histopath markers to figure out the cause of death, to do it as well as they do on CSI. Um, can, can you generalize about what is it, it's all happens in the winter, it looks like? Yes. Um, is that because infection takes over or because they literally starve? They what literally they, starve. They starve. Things stop growing in November, really, and so, yeah, um, the condition of the sheep who even survive um, even survive a non-crash winter is pathetic. They really are scraping by. We are talking, it's about 58 degrees north latitude. It's very dark, like there's four, three or four hours of daylight a day. It's really bad winter conditions. And so um, malnutrition definitely is an important you contributor. Don't think that ANA this levels can be a marker of general viability and nutritional status? Well, we're also measuring albumin, right? So we're trying to pull that apart because we did worry that the one, one reason we might see um, antibodies as survival promoters independent of infection-specific defense is that they were just telling us about somebody who's in better shape overall, like a condition-dependent effect. Um, and so what we've done is these albumin measures and other nutritional plane measures, and it, it just lets us explain more variance in survival and doesn't, again, doesn't knock an the antibodies out of the model. I keep thinking of them as competing to explain the survival effect, and I keep thinking we're going to knock them out, but we haven't yet. First of all, thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Um, so my question is about the uh, association, um, the negative association with fertility. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas about what the underlying mechanisms might be and whether there's any causal relationship or you think there's a third factor? I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Um, we, we really do not know, but um, because we see it in both sexes, we think there may be a role for the kind of resource allocation problem that I pose, that amino acids invested in immunity are not available to uh, reproductive activities. But it's just a, it's just a guess. Again, we're, as we're rolling out these um, nutritional plane markers, we may be able to, by accounting for variation in individual condition, we may be able to pull that apart in a more satisfying way. What I can say is that other systems where people have experimentally controlled nutritional plane and observed um, fecundity um, uh, would be consistent with nutrition as, as the mediator of this relationship. Um, but it is a complex problem. I mean, it's well known that pregnancy um, is, uh, makes multiple sclerosis go into remission. So, you know, autoimmune prone humans who get pregnant and carry that through successfully, they end up with a period of remission from symptoms. And you know, so the, again, the, the, the immunological phenomenon that is pregnancy may also be important in the use here. And we just have not unpacked that story. That's because the, there's much greater asymmetry in breeding success in males. I think it's because of greater intercept variation. Like one or two males get 80% of the breeding, whereas most of the females breed in any given year. So we are a couple of minutes after one o'clock. I'd like to take one or two more brief questions and then we should break. Yeah. Please pass the microphone. A couple of dichotomies. Uh, number one, at the end of your talk, 
It's generally thought that as an individual ages, autoimmunity goes up and immune responsiveness goes down. Have you tried to dissect that, taking a look at immune responsiveness, the strength of an, an immune response, as opposed to the autoimmune response? And that's the second question is the other dichotomy, and that is with your autoantibodies. Have you tried to distinguish between natural autoantibodies and pathogenic autoantibodies? Right, so we're, we're, we've made more progress on your former question than we have on your latter. Um, I, I think in the next few months in the Taiwanese human population, we'll be able to say what role antibodies, these autoantibodies play, if any, in light of the great inflammatory changes associated with aging. So far, it looks like ANA may still be doing something quite parallel to what it did in the sheep, uh, or the associations we observed in the sheep, um, but we haven't really nailed the analyses yet, and they may yet drop out, and then I'll come back to you and say, autoantibodies aren't, aren't doing what we thought, what you really need to think about, the pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Your second question about pulling apart pathogenic and benign specificities within that ANA pool. Well, I'm not thinking of benign. I'm thinking of natural autoantibodies in terms of physiological that may be beneficial that do something. Okay, positive. fair enough. Sorry, yes, that's what I meant. The ones that aid homeostasis. Mm -hmm. um, all we have been, because that's really difficult, and I, I always say, well, the rheumatologists haven't figured it out, so I don't feel too badly about not having figured it out myself. But we were able to start by asking about nat natural antibodies in terms of very cross-reactive ones. Are we just picking up on things that would bind anything, right? They bind mammalian nuclear components, but they also will bind uh, leptospira or you know some path, uh, parasite or pathogen that comes down the pike. And we cannot explain all of our results in light of that. So we, when we pull apart those components of the ANA pool, we still see this um, positive protective effect. Um, you may want to just look at I, the class of antibody, IgM versus IgG, because that may tell you something about the natural. Right. The so we pull, IgM are one of the ones we pulled out, and, okay. and IgM also promotes survival, but independent of these. Okay. So, yeah, we, we haven't made very much headway, but so those were the easiest ones for us to do. So we did those first, and those haven't explained it away either. Okay, thanks very much.